John Sari has been at the forefront of the electronic music industry for over three decades. His visionary compositional skills have revolutionized today's contemporary electronic music. Along with his extensive portfolio of over 30 recordings with combined sales in the millions, Sari's list of achievements is diverse and esteemed. He produced the score and sound design for the first interactive production on advanced robotics and artificial intelligence with Lucasfilm and the Hayden Planetarium in New York City. His music is used in thousands of planetariums worldwide. He composed the music for the galaxies across space and time. IMAX and Space Telescope Science Institute feature film about the discovery of deep field galaxies beyond the known universe. He composed music for the hit Hollywood film, What the Bleep Do We Know? and David Carradine's Tai Chi series. His music is heard on PBS, the Discovery Channel, the Weather Channel, and the U.S. Navy Blue Angels. John is a former U.S. Air Force search and rescue pilot with advanced instrument and commercial ratings and holds the coveted Disaster Relief Presidential Award with Valor for his flying in the deep water horizon Gulf oil spill. His music is utilized in the medical community for sleep research, hospice spiritual care, and music therapy for autistic children. John is a spiritual care volunteer for Hospice Atlanta. John Sari, welcome to the Nexus. Thanks for being here, my friend. Thank you very much. My pleasure. Subject of today's show is the sound of space. And in the exploration that I've had over the last several decades is about sound and about space and how they are both independent, yet they are coexistent. They are required for one another, if you will. And John, your work over the last 30 plus years has just been a, a catalog of creativity, spanning time and space, as it were, with sound. And I'd really like to talk to you about what that concept, what that idea, what that imagery evokes. Because I think one of the things we're seeing in society is a lot of people are starting to have questions about both sound and in particular space and time and all of those wonderful scientific models and methodologies that men, math, models, and machines keep trying to throw their their efforts into to try to define. But I think it's really much more fundamental than that. I think there's really an innate aspect of our experience of our human nature, of the nature of consciousness and the characteristics of consciousness that are very fundamental, they're very subtle, yet they're very profound. And I have to say that your latest release, which we'll play a little bit later, Ascendant Destiny, uh, I think is of all of the works that I've listened to of yours over the years, this is probably one of your finest. Thank you. When I put it on the first time and gave it a spin, I was, I was captivated because I thought, well, I'll put it on the surround sound in the living room. It'll fill the house. I cranked everything up, and I commenced to putz about. And within five or ten minutes, I found myself having to quit my putz and to sit down and just allow myself to be absorbed in it. Tell us a little bit about Ascendant Destiny and, and how that came about. Well, what I really wanted to do was was go for two directions, Destiny being uh, a time and Ascendant being a direction and a motion. And uh, those, those two things seem to go together good. Um, destiny being infinite, and ascendant being infinite. So with those two directions being combined, you know, you wanted the music to really give both of those ideas a flavor. And uh, technically what you wanted to do is have the music as, as wide as possible and surround as possible. Um, in the synthesizer program, you, you build those, those things into the synthesizer programming. And that was the direction that I used with all of the sounds and the sound design and the music going in, you know, as well as the mix and the balance of things. Wide and beautiful was the uh, order of the day. So it seems that the sound of space from your perspective is a very deep, infinite field of both time and space. Yes, yes. absolutely. And music is the language that you use to get there. 
uh, because music is its own, you know, language. And to me, music itself is the infinite, uh, since there is no uh, direction or or uh, solid space that you're going into. It's it's surround and it's infinite, and you're using music as a as a painting. It seems to me that the space that sound inhabits is that infinite field of frequencies, of energy, of all of the different waves and modes that sound is as it travels through space. Yes. And I think, let me ask you this, do you think that may be one of the reasons that that people are enjoying not only uh, frequency-based uh, meditations and and sonic realms, particularly when they get in the sophageo frequencies and um, right. the brown noise, white noise. Uh, I've even seen recently orange, pink, and yellow noise, uh, and found that to be quite fascinating. Mm-hmm. But do do you think that it's the resonance within space that sound becomes that universal language? Yeah, I think that's that's exactly where things are going. You know, with with synthesizers and the, and the instruments and tools that I'm using, there really is no uh, limit to them, and you can make the most subtle changes, and it will open up whole new areas. So when I go to to program sounds, I'm moving very slowly on the knobs and the buttons because the slightest change can make you know a big difference in where a person's directions, where a person's attention is going to go. And uh, so it's really, um, it's really my trip as far as where I want to go. And I'm inviting the audience to come along with me, you know, because part of what I say a lot to myself is, I got to get off this planet, <laughs> you know, and, I'll and you, know, you, can, you take a look at certain <laughs> things that are going on. And that's the first thing that comes to mind is like, I just got to get off this planet, you know. But at the same time, there's there's a, a, a friendly invitation there, you know. And I'm I'm going to leave the planet using this starship called Music, and uh, you're all welcome to come along with me, you know. Uh, always remember that it's my ship, and I know kind of where I'm going with it, and uh, and having the audience understand that and come along with me means that I can use you know, a certain amount of technology and certain uh, aspects and techniques that I use that I know my audience will understand. Well, let's talk a little bit more about that and the work that Mm -hmm. you've done in the space industry, if you will, because I think that that is one of the reasons your work, I know that when I saw the performance the you do a, have been doing a regular Christmas performance at the planetariums. And uh, the last one I saw several years ago was just mind-boggling. You are not only entrenched in this and and just absorbed into this sonic beauty and realm, but then you have the visuals of the stars. Right. And if you're in a planetarium, for those who haven't been to one, I highly recommend it. But, John, talk about that work, which, how, getting into the planetarium and working with uh, the, NASA itself and mm-hmm. some of the other things that you've done in your career. Well, you know, when I first started to do this kind of, of uh, work, I was working at uh, Electronic Music Laboratories which is a, uh, a synthesizer manufacturer in Connecticut known as the EML line of synthesizers. And they were a small company that was run by aerospace engineers. And their idea at first was to create educational tools for schools. So they built these indestructible kind of instruments that were like, you, you could tell they were designed by engineers you know, where they weren't really designed by musician-type engineers. They were designed by real engineer engineers. You know, you had a full patch bay of uh, inputs and outputs that was built right into the very top of it. So you could have total access to how to change things around in the synthesizer if you wanted to. And not, not a lot of other synthesizers did that. That's the one thing that I really kind of appreciated, you know. And for me, uh, being a, a sound engineer really kind of, I've, I've fell into like a total relationship 
you know, with them as engineers, you know, not necessarily as musicians. I know that, that Moog and Arp were aimed at the musician, whereas I felt that EML was aimed at the engineer musician because it, it opened up, you know, the internal structure for the player, for the user of the instrument to have total access. Where on, on several other instruments, kind of that access was pre-thought. So that really helped me, you know, like expand the nature of, of what I was doing. The other thing was that synthesizers were making these un otherworldly sounds. And, you know, to me, it was like, well, who is going to understand this? <laughs> you know, if I really push the boundaries of these things, you know, who is my audience going to be? And, you know, how am I going to communicate with them? And so a friend of mine said, you know, when he came up to the studio, he said, have you ever taken any of this to the planetariums? There's one here in Hartford. You ought to take it down there to him. You know, and I, and it, to me, it was like, why didn't I think of that you know, <laughs> kind of thing? <laughs> you know, and so I said, wow. So I went down with some demo tapes and played it for the crew down there. And they went, you know, this music is a dream that we've been having. We'd been waiting for somebody to come up with sounds like this. And I said, well, I've been, you know, doing this for a while. So this sounds like a real, like, exciting possibility because the planetarium was the only visual aid that I could ever see myself in, you know, as far as doing that kind of thing. And that's why I really kind of specialized in doing concerts in the planetarium, which a lot of musicians never really thought of that, you know, whereas I found it to be a total natural extension of, of the sounds and the music that I was making and found that the audience was right there, ready to be appreciative of what I was doing. So when I went to the first few conventions for planetariums, they were blown away. And they wait, said, wait, wait, they have the planetarium industry has a convention. Yeah, they have several conventions around the world every year. They have regional conventions like the the ones in the East Coast, the ones in the West Coast, the ones in the South, the ones in the North, and in different countries. And then they have international conventions where all of them get together at, you know, a large facility in Spain or New York City or Brazil or Canada or something like this. And uh, the, usually those planetariums are like state-of-the-art monsters. Just they can do anything. You know, they have the best surround sound systems, the best star fields, the best effects. And uh, the people that show up at these conventions are just, you know, aliens as far as I'm concerned. And I consider myself <laughs> to be one of them, you know, because their minds are so expanded into, into space already. It's like they were born into it. So, you know, the planetarium field became my home. And it was, it was just a, a marriage made in heaven. I mean, think the idea that not only did you get into working with the electronic music uh, from the standpoint of an engineer's perspective, you know, right. I, I, when you were talking about it, I was imagining a bunch of guys walking around with pocket protectors. and That's exactly you know. what they looked like when I started to work at Electronic Music Labs. <laughs> they were aerospace engineers who decided to play with uh, sound modules and things like this, and they were designing synthesizers for the educational system in Connecticut. So they approached it as engineers, not as musicians. And that I found to be fascinating. You know, everyone else was was pretty much aiming these things at working musicians. And these guys were aiming at it at uh, engineering students type thing and, and educational facilities. So with that combination, it really just blew the doors off everything that, that I was thinking. You know, infinite space designed by engineers who really understood what was going on in these machines and how to get there. Now, when you were working with them from the sound mm -hmm. reproduction perspective, were they, right. did they have just studio monitors? Did they, did they even get into some of the surround models or? No, they really didn't. Did All work? they really had was just a small little recording studio, a small little facility uh, up in the attic of where they were working that would demonstrate the synthesizers. And when I walked in there, they had nobody demonstrating the synths. They had somebody who had just left, and I arrived at just the right time. And they were like, do you know what to do with these things? We just make them. But do you know really, do you know what to do with them? And I said, well, yeah, I kind of know what to do with them. You know? 
you know, there's there were the performance side of things with Keith Emerson, Rick Waitman, Larry Fast, the Synergy Projects, you know, and a few of those who were really performance oriented. But I was more of the musician engineer oriented. You know, I wanted to see this applied to space, applied to NASA, rocket scientists. You know, these are the kind of people that, that I felt comfortable being around. And they all hung around planetariums. They, they loved them. So it was a marriage made in heaven. So have you ever done a show with a pocket protector yourself and homage to these guys? <laughs> You know something? <laughs> that is a great idea. <laughs> I'm going to wear a pocket protector next time. <laughs> well, I, I find it really fascinating and, and very interesting that coming at it from an engineering perspective, mm -hmm. and that to me is one of the, is a great example of what I see uh, that we're all uh, on the verge of. In fact, we're right. I think we're starting to go this, on a crest of a tsunami of the independent content creators and the the ability for people to just explore with all yes. the different tools and toys and ideas and opening opening up the inspiration, the creativity, the curiosity, the imagination. Um, yep. And that, to me, is one of the really fascinating things about your music. Um, mm -hmm. Ascendant Destiny is, I believe, the, close to your 30th album. Yes, that it you've is. Produced. It's number 30. And, uh, I mean, that is a substantial body of work. Um, mm -hmm. I, I have enjoyed and spent many hours just drifting off into off-planet. Yes. Which which is a very uh, apropos subject for the the time right now. We'll just talk a little bit about the idea of, you know, what's going on with the, the whole UFO or ufology or ufology, mm -hmm. depending on what, which side <laughs> you, <laughs> which side you, yes, you kind of lean towards, but sure. this whole idea of um, disclosure and, and I've gone on a few rants on various shows about this, but you know, mm -hmm. the, everybody's talking about disclosure from the standpoint of, you know, are these things that we're seeing in the sky, uh, are they theirs or are they ours? Mm -hmm. um, and I think that, to me, the whole idea of disclosure is the wrong term. It's really, if you look at what they're talking about disclosure, what's happening is uh, it's not the discussion of whether it's theirs or ours and what percentage of them. Right, right. The underlying reality is are we alone because even mm -hmm. if it's five or ten percent of them being theirs then clearly we're not alone right and to me that question was answered millennia ago mm -hmm. every civilization their cosmologies that we've been able to uncover decipher and and sure. decode all has the same kind of story they all have this somebody from up there came down here they gave us stuff they mm -hmm. taught us stuff, told us stuff, and hell, maybe they even made us in some way, shape, or form. Yeah. So, so I think that the, the the reality is it's the term is incorrect. It shouldn't be disclosure. It should be exposure. Exposure. Because that's very good. Sure. Because the folks that have been holding on to this technology for the last at least seven or eight or more decades mm -hmm. have been holding on to technology that had they released it and let the rest of us children play too in the playground with all the toys, we'd be in a totally different world. And there yes. may be, uh, you know, Tesla had it right, I think, um, Heaviside, Maxwell, all of these different right. engineers, scientists, yes. they understood the ether. They knew that the ether is there. And despite all of the um, angst that's going on in the scientific and particularly the quantum and physics uh, worlds, yeah. The ether is the ether is where it's at. And the ether yes. is what space is. You can't have anything without space. Right. And I I will admit that I have fun going in and poking on the physicists who uh, are all into this grit model and everything's little billiard balls bouncing off of one another and so forth. Right. And, right. And they, you know, the the common thing is uh, the meme is that space is a vacuum. And that means that it's empty. Mm -hmm. And it's amazing how tweaked these folks get when you ask them, well, the space is a vacuum. How does the planet exist in space? <laughs> if the, nothing point. can exist, right? 
So um, that's my my little rant on the space thing. But I think that it, for me, what's going on with the disclosure, it's really exposure and it's exposing the fact that all of this technology has been sequestered and suppressed for decades. And yeah. uh, it's about to come out, though. I believe we're, we're about to see is a when we get on the other side of this burning dumpster fire that we're all try, trying to avoid and dance around, mm-hmm. that the the other side is going to be extremely profound in very awesome and beneficial ways. And I think technology is going to be one of the key components of that. Yes. Um, getting into everything from understanding the reality in the world that we inhabit to how right. we inhabit it. Um, in particular, our medical systems, the technologies for sound and light, as it mm-hmm. relates to healing, is going to be one of the most fundamental transformations that we'll see in our knowledge base of reality. Which takes me back to what you said about you want to get off planet. Mm-hmm. Our mm-hmm. our cosmic cousins are coming. They're here, and they're going to be making a lot more noise about what that really means. Yeah, and, I, and what I I'm trying be, to do. <laughs> sure, go ahead. Yeah. Go no, go ahead. Good. Yeah, what I'm trying to do is kind of give them a musical language or a portal to communicate through. And I think that, you know, um, because I'm trying to talk to them as well, I kind of know that they're here. You know, they they uh, make their presence known sometimes, even within the machines, the synthesizers themselves, with some of the ideas that are coming through, where your hand will move a certain way over to that knob rather than this one, or this particular technique over to that one. And sometimes... I feel like they're they're in the studio and they're directing some actions that are going on, you know. And to be able to do that means, you know, an emphasis on meditation. Because meditation enables you to get out of your own way and, you know, let the creativity flow through you in a pure way. And if you're working with machines that are advanced enough, like some of these, you know, the Moogs and the, and the the keyboards and the Rollins and everything like that, you know, these people invented, the people who worked on them, you know, there's no doors to these things. They're wide open. And that's how they they advertise it as well. They said, no, the creativity's in your hands. We just kick the doors open. You know, these oscillators, filters, envelopes, patch bays, and everything like that are just tools for the infinite mind. And I think that there's some infinite minds out there that are influencing human beings that are playing with these things, you know. That is sometimes, and that's where meditation comes in for me, is like opening myself up to their directions, to their own hands moving through me, to the language in, that these machines allow you to, to speak. Ooh, that is, um, that's mm-hmm. profound. I, you essentially, and I have felt this way, and you and I have, we go back a few decades um, yes, we in, do. Our, in our experience together. And mm-hmm. it's always been, um, the the connection has always been a very solid resonance of sound mm-hmm. and being able to understand it, appreciate it, and, and experience it. Right. Um, being a musician, uh, I think, is for those who think that it's all them, I think that they're missing a great deal of the creativity that's available yes. to them. I will agree with that. Yeah, I think that's, and I think that's what you're talking about. It's actually the channeling of yes. and being open, being an open vessel for those frequencies, for those ideas, that inspiration, mm-hmm. those modes of sonic resonance that flow through us all, all yeah. the time. But I don't think that people are not only not aware of it as much as they could be, but uh, are not taking advantage of it as much as they should. Yes, because sound and it goes back again to your idea or your thought about being off planet and creating right. this universal space music is the language of the universe in my opinion yes it is so it is it's it's so far beyond i mean it's wide open music is is a wide open language it really is an infinite language and you know the way that you can take people into space and kind of leave them hanging out there. And like one of my favorite sayings is, I, I just take you out there. Getting back is up to you. <laughs> you know, like, I might have to steal that one. <laughs> yeah, go right ahead. You know, I mean, that's that's basically how it feels. And to to have these things 
you know, speak back at you. If you wanted to really say, I want to go, you know, far beyond Pluto and the synths themselves will, well, let's go. It's like they, they speak back to you, you know, just with a twist of a knob or an idea or part of a reverb setting or an echo setting or a spatializer setting or something like this. You know, it's, it's an invitation. And sometimes it just really feels like there's uh, another otherworldly presence in the studio with you, directing your hands and your mind and speaking to you through the electronics. It feels using, like that. Using them as the tools and the toys for to express the voice, to express Correct. the sound, right? Correct. And sometimes late at night, you know, it really does feel like that in here. Sometimes, <laughs> you know, uh, yeah, UFOs. Bring them on. <laughs> yeah, I, them I on. really, I really enjoy watching all of the uh, hype and hyperbole, sex sizzle and muss and fuss around UFOs and and then they decided that, uh, well, we've got to, you know, upgrade the UFO thing and we're going to now call it mm -hmm. UAPs or the Unidentified Aerial Phenomena. It's like, okay, yeah. whatever. Um, there's still, as far as any, most of the people around the world, they're going to look at it as, well, that's a UFO. I'm, that's unidentified. Mm -hmm. It is flying. And the most of them are. But then yeah. we have all these other uh, anomalies where they, you have lights and pulsating orbs and things that don't right. seem to fall into the category of flying as yeah, much as they are being. Yes. Sure. And uh, speaking of that, you're also a pilot. Correct. Yeah, and if you really want to talk to uh, people about UFOs, talk to some airline pilots. Because they'll tell you. I mean, you know, my father-in-law uh, was a Pan Am pilot for many years. And uh, he tells stories about things, about crafts coming right up to the cockpit windows and a dancing with the airplane type thing, zooming away, you know, at speeds or coming up to them at speeds, being very playful. And they will tell you stories. So I think, you know, if, if you really wanted to get into it, talk to some airline pilots because they're out there, you know, late at night, they're out there early in the morning, they're out there 24 hours a day and they see things that they're either not allowed to talk about or would people would never believe them if they said it. And my father-in-law tells stories like this. He's a Pan Am pilot for 30 years. He's seen aerial phenomena out there many times. Sometimes it's like, you know, the airline pilots will say, look at that thing. Ah, come on. They're just they're, they're those guys again. Jeez, it's getting boring out here. Show me another kind of crap. <laughs> and, you know, they really see it. They're up close and personal with it. And that's basically, as a pilot, yeah, uh, I want to get up in the air and, and uh, be with them. You know, even though I'm wearing some metal wings and a cockpit and a fuselage and some instruments, uh, I, I'm with you on that. I'm flying with you. So part of that was a really uh, important part of me becoming a pilot. So d d are, have you gotten high enough to where you've been to the edge of the atmosphere and had that that little twitch and question should i go ahead <laughs> <laughs> yeah when i was flying it was like i knew you know that first of all you know the the military guys and the nasa guys and the rest of them are in a whole kind of another category that you really have to go to school for you know, and, and concentrate on before you're going to get in one of those cockpits, you know, that type of thing, you know. But I've been out there at night sometimes, and I've seen some uh, interesting things going faster than normal, you know, zipping across the field of vision, you know, especially when you look way, way out there, you know, when you're above, like maybe you're at 15,000 feet, something like that, 12,000 feet. I mean, you're pretty much up there. And uh, you, you're going to see some stuff if they're out there, especially at night, early in the morning, especially at night. It reminds me of a uh, one of those experiences that unless you experienced it, you, you really can't imagine it. But back in the 90s, when I was traveling around the world in my tech mm -hmm. career, I was in um, Johannesburg, actually left uh, Cape Town, South Africa. Mm -hmm. 
and Cape Town to Miami with that time was one of the longest flights uh, in the world. It was a 15-hour straight flight. Yeah. So we left at about 9 p.m. I think it was on a Thursday or Friday night, and it was one of the jumbo 747-400s wow. and had the, yeah. the knob on the top. And I'm sitting down there, and uh, I had this huge leg room, all these windows looking out, and we were flying over the Atlantic. It was a beautiful night. The moon was shining. There was a few clouds, and we were, I think, at close to 30,000 or some odd feet. Right. And so we were above the clouds, and I could see the shadow of the cloud on the ocean, mm-hmm. which was you know, just a profound in and of itself. Sure. So I'm thinking, well, this is a long flight. I'm going to go ahead and uh, uh, take as as many adult libations as possible to make this an enjoyable <laughs> flight. Perfect. The flight attendant comes back, comes by me at one point. I'm looking out the window. I've got my face plastered on the window, just going, "Oh my god!" And he, I said, "That's just incredible." And he says, "Yeah, we see it every flight, every trip we make on this." And uh, I said, "I bet it looks awesome from the cockpit." And he said. You want to go see? And I nice. went, huh? So he took off and he came back a few minutes later and got me up there. And I'm, I've got a scotch in my hand. The cat cockpit door is open. The two pilots are there and they're surrounded mm-hmm. by all this incredible technology. And I'm looking out the windows with them. And I'm thinking, you know, I'd buy you guys a drink, but I'd like to make it to our destination. Um, and so I can't believe that I'm on this in the cockpit of a 747 and I asked them both um, I said okay guys come on you can tell me do you guys ever see weird stuff out here at night Mm -hmm. and the captain just said no 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 no, we don't see anything and the co-pilot looked at me and he goes well last week we were making (laughs) we were making this run and this light went across the horizon in front of us that just didn't make any sense. Yeah. And so, you know, just to back up what you're saying, but I think that we are probably going to see more and more of these UFO, UF, UAPs, uh, EIEIOs, yeah. um, to the degree where people are going to have more experiences about wanting to go communicate with them. Mm-hmm. Right. And because it I does think that's seem. That's the idea. I think that's what they're thinking as well. I I think there's more benevolence in that crowd of cosmic cousins. There seems to be Mm -hmm. a a number of different uh, versions of them. Um, But I think that they like the music and the sound of space too. Yeah, I think they do too. There's, There's a language there that they understand, and it's a language of frequencies and moving frequencies, motion frequencies, you know, that are moving in interdimensional spaces anyway. You know, so I pretty much jumped all over that and said, I think I know how to get there. Just by turning this little knob over here at the right time, I think we can get there. And that happens all the time. It happens all the time. It's like somebody else is moving your hands, especially when it comes to the electronic side especially when it comes to the electronic side. It, it takes a, a, a real understanding of the machines that you're using. You just can't put anybody in, in front of them and have this kind of communication happen. It's almost like they, they wait for you to come up to speed. How well do you understand the electrons that are moving inside these things? Uh, because we're moving electrons as well. And uh, maybe we can talk a little bit by moving electrons together. You know, and it feels like that sometimes. It really does. You know, like you've you've got to surrender a little bit and say, "Teach me, show me, help me to communicate with you." I'm open, and you feel presence. You really do. So I I consider them to be interdimensional. I don't know if they're coming from beyond the realm of Pluto. I think it might be an interdimensional pathways portals through time and space somehow, you know, but they can blink in and blink out quicker than, you know, anything. And like that takes an interdimensional connection rather than a a time and distance connection. Yeah, I I tend to uh, agree with that with a different, Mm -hmm. a little slightly different twist. I have a a philosophy I've been working on called Informatica, which is the metrics in the matrix. Great name. And the whole... 
the whole idea, thank you, and the whole idea, it, is, it was a download. It was one of those things like you're talking about. It was a, mm-hmm. a bolt at about 2 or 3 in the morning that just came as a flood of information. I fortunately had my little wow. uh, Galaxy phone, and it had the stylus with it, so I just wrote notes of all of this information. Mm-hmm. But it, it's a simple concept in that, to me, it's the it's the unified field theory um, yes. or the, the grand yes. theory in that everything is a consciousness, Consciousness mm-hmm. manifests itself with common characteristics and attributes in that it's always in motion. Mm-hmm. It always seems to be wherever that motion is, there seems to be a constant creation event right. because it's unfolding more and more of itself. And it expresses that through the energy. It is consciousness right. is an energy. And Correct. energy is expressed in frequencies. So frequencies are the infinite expression of the energy of consciousness. Yes, and that's a great point. So in the in to me what happens it creates this infinite field of frequencies. Mm-hmm. So the dimensional aspect when people talking about uh, the interdimensional or hyperdimensional or omnidimensional uh, mm-hmm. is th- just different states of those frequencies. Yes. So you can shift in between the freak, infinite frequency fields, and they just exist as a part of reality. It's not necessarily right. a different reality. Um, and I think that, again, sound and frequency is, is the key to reality, and yeah. we are seeing that unfold in a myriad of ways. So mm-hmm. staying on this um, uh, topic of space and and in particular your experience with not only working with the planetariums, but uh, Mm -hmm. let's talk about your work with NASA, our other space Mm -hmm. uh, admin and institutions, and and also with Lucasfilm, and how how your connection to space from that perspective has unfolded. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, my work with NASA was just a, it really came out of the planetarium industry because NASA is very much involved with the planetarians and count on the planetarians to present everything that they found to the young minds out there, you know, and the planetarians are really the, the way that they speak all of this like unspeakable stuff, you know, through mathematics or through stuff that they've discovered, uh, theories, scientists, you know, genius type scientists and stuff. The planetarians are really the portal of language that they use to teach and they really count on it, you know, because it's the only one that presents the whole thing in like 3D. And th- there you've got, you know, basically a shell with a star machine that's able to project, you know, little dots surrounded by infinite darkness. And like when uh, uh, when I take a look at those things, you know, you could say, well, they're just dots on the ceiling. Yeah, but not really. Because there's such a perfect representation especially these days, you know, with what they can do with those little dots on the ceiling and, and the kind of motions they present these days, the kind of things that you can do um, are just mind boggling, that kind of stuff. And like for me, um, I always wondered, why aren't there other musicians involved in this? And even to this day, there's not a lot of musicians who are really focused on it. And I'm like, this is a wide open music, sound, infinite space festival, if you want to talk about it, if you want to put it that way. And like, where are you guys? Are you going to leave this whole thing to me? Thank you very much. <laughs> I'll do it all myself. You know, even to this day, it's like the, they still want to get on the radio and that's great, you know, but I want to get on the dome. You know, I want to be in that space and I want to take other people with me, you know, with the music. So the planetarians have been just as inspiring to me as the music has been inspiring to them. So how did that translate into working with NASA? Well, NASA really focuses in on the planetarium industry to present what they have found to young minds through the educational system. That's what planetariums have been really an educational tool more than anything. Mm-hmm. Um, yes, it is an entertainment vehicle, but it's they're aimed at the young minds. They, they got planetarium programs that start at kindergarten and go up to the college level. And 60 to 70% of their time is spent on school shows, school programs, university programs, you know, 
this is where the main thing is. The public, yes, we're going to present ideas that we have found to the public, but we're talking to the students. Mm. We're talking to the educational side of things, you know, and that's why they call planetariums classrooms because that's basically what they are, you know, and they, they take science students in and say, we're going to the planetarium today and we're going to show you what we're talking about on, in the classroom, but we're going to present it now so that you can see it for real as close as you can get. We're going to present biology ideas, cell formations, this kind of thing. We're going to project it on this huge dome. We're going to put you inside the cell. We're going to, we're going to have you walking on the rings of Saturn if you want. And these days with IMAX and OmniMax and the rest of them, get ready because they can really do that now. And sound follows function, follows that image. And I'm constantly challenged you know, to come up with different ways of how can I make that sound close to that infinite reality there? You know, how can I fool the mind, you know, and trick it into coming alongside the infinite? That kind of thing. Changing the mental frequencies to be in alignment with the, what they're seeing and feeling. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Awesome. So, And technology the, can do that. So you've seen the latest uh, stuff that's coming out of the James Webb Space Telescope. Yeah. Where, where now they're pushing, uh, and that's another thing I like to go in and poke fun at these physics folks. Um, mm -hmm. Because, you know, they, up until uh, James Webb, you know, the mm -hmm. standard model is some 13 plus billion years old in, in the universe. Right. And James Webb has already doubled that and now is coming up with stuff that don't fit any of the math models men and machines have put output. And right. they're looking at it going, well, we can't explain this. This we're not <laughs> sure about. Um, right. Oh, shit, that, that wasn't in the calculation or in the answer we got. That's so right. So there's a, there's a constant change. But I can only imagine when they finally get some of that kind of um, the infrared is what they're using, obviously, for the James mm -hmm. Webb, and being able to see that projected in some of the planetarium technology that you're talking about. That, and, Correct. And also, oh, absolutely. Also the on the ultraviolet IMAX. ultraviolet universe, you know, looks vastly different than the infrared universe, which looks vastly different than the limited amount of eyeball information that we can get just with our eyes and our telescopes. There are levels to the universe that extend into, you know, frequencies, colors, modalities, realities, you know, that are just huge and uh, unspeakably complex and large and unbelievably, you know, uh, beyond the understanding and stuff. And, and that's what, what I call the mothership effect. To you know Spielberg, you know, and the mothership effect. You, you, when when they when Spielberg projected that mothership down in the movie Close Encounters, the the theater became silent, and all you heard was, "Oh my God, oh my God," and people's mouths were just wide open and just like, "Oh my God," you know, and I that's the feeling I go for every day, and I call it the mothership feeling. And the, my tools are sound and synthesis in order to get there. So that's what I'm trying to do with the music is create the mothership feeling inside somebody's mind. Well, I'd like to talk a little bit about the, the tools and the techniques in your mm -hmm. mothership because I you I would consider you're, you're at the helm there of, of the mothership. Um, right. But before we get into that, uh, talk a little bit about what you did with Lucasfilms and some of the other places where you were mm -hmm. approached to music. Obviously, the planetarium, and then uh, that's just, uh, to me, I, I echo your question. Why are musicians not understanding it? Um, you are the yeah. beneficiary, or, or are you taking advantage of it? You are a beneficiary of it, so they're just leaving it up to you. So I envy you in that you've got this yeah. place where nobody else is playing. You're like, okay, well, I'll bring my ball and bat, and I'll come out here and play some. Mm -hmm. um, but talk a little bit about the Lucasfilm uh, works and things you've done there. Yeah, well, Lucasfilm uh, basically wants to, you know, get a hold of education, you know, the same way is like and a lot of their programs are are now being education based where they're getting into university getting into the schools a little bit you know because they know that they have a captive audience and they're they're t 
tacking on to that. So they have a whole educational thing going on that you don't really hear too much about. But mm. they're using university classrooms and elementary schools, you know, to present big ideas like this, starting at Star Wars and going beyond with that kind of thing. So education to them is, is very, very big. There's a whole educational division that Lucasfilm has come up with and is working with in the universities, in schools, in classrooms, that type nice. of thing. So, yeah, so you they're are... into it. They know how young and how pliable those the young minds are, how open they are. And, you know, Luke, George Lucas is, is a kid. He's been one of us for forever, you know, and he <laughs> has come out and said, I maintain my childhood as much as I possibly can. I am a child of the universe. I just have incredible tools to work with. So now, he's one of us. I totally agree with that. I think Spielberg mm -hmm. is kind of, he's either an alien or he's a hybrid or something. Yeah, the <laughs> same he, way. The same way. He might be you know, in that How would same... you like to attend a dinner between those two? Sitting down at a restaurant, what do they talk about? You know, unbelievable that, that's stuff. Gotta be... You know, those minds, un infinite minds with, you know, wonderful tools to, to work with. Lucas and Spielberg, are, you know, they're alien. Yeah, you know, I mean, are. that's got... That's got to be a serious cosmic conversation going on there. Yes, definitely. Um, now, the movie "What the Bleep Do You Know" or "Do We Know"? Mm -hmm. um, you were involved with that. Talk Correct. about that a little bit, because that kind of ties into this whole conversation we're having about space and our cousins and God knows what else is out there yeah. that we're about to find. Yeah. Well, that whole idea was was the brainchild, you know, of a couple of people who wanted to go into in, in the classrooms and say, we want to push the boundaries of knowledge. How far out does knowledge reach? And we want to be able to, to bring that into, into a focus, into a way that people will understand, you know, just how broad-based real knowledge is. So we're going to find the smartest scientists, the smartest physicists, you know, the, the, the wacky imaginary type people out there and we're just going to talk to them we're going to let them present their ideas we're going to throw some visuals up there but it's really the talking and the ideas that they were presenting you know that brought people into it and they said you know it was the funny story is um when they first came out with that movie or when they were putting it together they were going to call it something different which was what the uh, f do we know Mm. you know and they were going to use that phrase you know if you get my drift here oh yeah you know? so a lot of people said if you think you're going to get that word into the movie theaters and impress a bunch of people you're wrong they're not going to let you go with that title they're simply not going to let you go with that title so the brainiacs got together the people of the, and they said well how do we say this well what do you think you know every single time that that word is used somewhere it's bleeped Right, they they bleep it out, so they went, yeah, that that works. What the bleep do we know? So the whole thing was like a happy accident, where they wanted to say it but they couldn't say it, but they found a way. They found a way to say it. What the bleep do we know? And just that word, you know, was enough to just trigger the imagination of so many people. That whole thing. So when I first was approached, it, they were planning on using that bad word. <laughs> you know, <laughs> and so I had told the producer, I said, I don't know if I want my name associated with that word out there, especially with the movie. And they said, well, you know, we're getting such pushback on that. We've decided to change it to the word bleep. And I said, bingo. That's the perfect title to the movie that you want to present. What the bleep do we know? And they said, you know, we're, we're just going to present everything we know so far. And we're going to get the best scientists, engineers, biologists, anybody we can find. And we're going to just have them talk. And this is what we know so far. This is what we know. And so so how, did you approach, how did you approach that compositionally and musically? Musically, I, I pretty much said, okay, let's take a little bit of uh, Planetary Chronicles, Volume 1 and Volume 2, certain albums that I had had, you know, and they said, you know, we love 
uh, this kind of music and the stars go with you was a big part of that. And they said, would you mind if we just, you know, license some of the music because we're, we're falling in love with it, you know? And they said, well, we'll let you know, you know, if we need something co cosmic, but some of your work that you've made, you know, especially from Tingri, uh, they really love that album and they went for it. And I said, yeah, license, license as much as you, as you want, as much as you want, go ahead. So it was like very easy for me because they already knew what they wanted. So I, I dressed it up around the edges, but they went with already stuff that was already recorded. So they heard the sonic realms that you'd created and matched it up with these, all these great thinkers and individuals with right. these, you know, cosmic spectrums of ideas and mm -hmm. said, this is going to fit great with, uh, I think Richard Wolff was one of them. They had all kinds of uh, a right. number of uh, physicists and psychics. I mean, it's really a great movie. For those that are listening to this or are unfamiliar with that, uh, highly recommend it. It's one of those kind of mind-expanding uh, types of trips that you go, well, it's interesting mm -hmm. to hear all these different ideas and concepts. Some of them are they have some kind of connectivity. Some of them are completely yeah. discontinuous and others are just completely out there, but it gives you something to think about that is probably not what you've thought about before. So that's right. And they use some of the finest minds to get there and mm -hmm. some, some pretty much off kilter ideas that were presented in a certain way, which made sense, which I, that's why I love the title of the movie. What the bleep do we know? Because it's a little sassy. <laughs> a little bit of sass in there, you know, and it, they could have said, you know, well, we don't know too much or this is what we know. But instead, they they and the whole movie comes at it in a sassy kind of way. There's enough humor in it where you see, you know, these these highly revered nuclear type physicist people joking around about what they know. You know, so the humor aspect is really phenomenal, the way that that is, is mixed in, you know, because they humanized these, you know, magnificent ideas, you know, in a, in a way that everybody could understand. You know, young people, teenagers, everybody, everybody got it because humor was used. It's great the way they did it. So there seems to be um, a consistent theme throughout your career and working with music that's, that mm -hmm. has an education element to it. Yes. There's a lot of commonality between all the, the different uh, works that you've done, the different institutions mm -hmm. and, and people that you've worked with. And I think that that's also one of the important things we're seeing is the rise of the independent content creators is Correct. the the education field is going to changed dramatically from the brick and mortar institutionalized academic models that we have now, mm -hmm. which, uh, just as a side commentary, I think that they've all failed miserably and, uh, for a number of reasons, but, um, that transformation is going to come as a result of things like what we're doing right now, the technology right. to, for individuals to be able to put their ideas, however, wacky, strange in out or wherever they may come from or be, to be able to put them out there for people to consume and learn from on their mm -hmm. own. Yes. And yes. Uh, your work has that, it's, I, it is, as I think about it, it, it's not surprising to me that I feel enlightened and my imagination and curiosity is piqued when I listen to your music. Yes, there's a, actually, there's a little technique that I use um, where silence becomes a musical instrument. And so that's, you know, synthesizers have, have gotten a reputation for being able to make, you know, all kinds of sounds, you know, and in some degrees, there's a little bit too much in there. So my thinking was use silence as a musical instrument in your compositions. You know, it could be the silence of, of uh, texture, or it could be the silence of notes, or it could be absolute silence. But every way, there's always an element around each sound that I make or, or a lot of the programming that I do that has a, a kind of a halo of silence around it. You know, and it's a, that, that's really important to me is to be able to leave enough 
room in there for a person's imagination and appreciation to have room to just repose and relax without throwing too many notes at them or too much composition at them. No, back that off and use silence as a language. Silence is space. Yeah, absolutely. There it is. There's uh, not a lot of sound in space out there. You know, it's basically as silent as silence gets. You know, there's nothing for sound to bounce off of out there. It and, goes on forever. At least in the frequency ranges that we can right. hear, right, or that our sensory capabilities uh, are, you know, can can detect. But mm -hmm. then you have the whole concept of the 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 planets, the sound of the planets, the music of Correct. the spheres, right? Um, that those are all frequencies that we just can't pick up with our biological meat sacks that we are, are using <laughs> where our, where our sensory uh, systems yeah. are, you know, embedded. But, um, when you said, you know, the use of silence, it reminded me of, I think it was, might've been Miles Davis. Um, but there was a number of jazz folks that parroted this same idea, which is mm -hmm. a great musician knows when not to play. Yes, absolutely. Write that one down. A great musician knows when not to play. Silence is a musical instrument, and you got to compose the silence. Well, silence is a sound. Yeah. Right? Absolutely. Just, just because we have a certain perspective uh, or you know view that we've been either given or adopted or come up with on our own, there's mm -hmm. so much more to sound, which yes. I think... Um, I think this would be a, a great time to bring in a little bit of your new album, um, Ascendant sure. Destiny. So I'm going to share the screen and we'll play a few moments of um, the beginning of this. And I, I want to encourage people to, and the links will be in the description below, but please go to johnserry.com. That's J-O-N-N-S-E-R-R-I-E.com. And you can learn all about John's uh, work, uh, all of his mm -hmm. his biography, the all of the <laughs> 30 albums that he's put out, as well as uh, some others. Um, but I encourage you to take a look and a listen. You will not only be very uh, pleased that you did, but you'll find a realm of sound and music that is something you may not have known that was out there that you will really resonate with. Let's have a little listen to Ascendant Destiny from John Sari.
simply just stellar. Thank you, my friend. Very much. Uh, it was interesting. Um, it had a, a very emotive power to it in a very calm and peaceful place. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that was the point of the exercise, basically. You know, you wanted to to present a very powerful image, but at the same way, uh, a very glossy feeling to it, very wide, very comforting in that way. It definitely, uh, you definitely achieved that. I, mm -hmm. I find that being able to be in that creative space, the place in space, where the creativity comes in and it resonates mm -hmm. and it flows through you is something you do uh, with just an exceptional mastery in your work. Thank you very much. So let's talk about how do you make something like this? What what are the tools, the the toys? And you you talked a little bit about the technique of silence. But mm -hmm. there's a lot more than silence going on here, my friend. How do you do this? Oh, yes. <laughs> well, sometimes I will use um, like an astronomy book that's filled with like beautiful images, and I'll use that as sheet music and pretty much concentrate on, you know, a way to to translate what I'm seeing into a musical image. Another way is reading science fiction pretty much on a constant basis. I don't really read anything else except science fiction. And what that does is like completely, you know, enhance my mind's ability to create music because it's the big picture. You know, when you read it, it's like you're not really seeing a movie but you're watching an internal movie. You're watching your mind at work creating these images as you read the, the words on the page. And for me, it's sheet music. The music just, just comes right off that page, you know, and then as, as kind of an ethereal quantity, let's say. And then you walk up to your machines and you begin to translate this into a language, you know, into an electronic language you know, that other people can understand. You know, using music as, you know, it's not going to sound like noise, even though you can turn noise into music very easily. And I use noise as a musical instrument, like many times. It's just that it's very uh, disguised noise, very pleasant kind of noise, but it's noise nonetheless. You know, in fact, there's a setting on a synthesizer called white noise. And what it is, is basically hiss. That you would hear off a you know a record or something like that that's shh like this, but you can shape that noise to do atmospheric things with it, you know, that become a musical instrument to me. So everything is possible on a synthesizer. It's the, it's the language of the infinite, as far as I'm concerned. One little movement of a knob can change the entire picture, you know. So for me, understanding. The, for the fundamentals is something that's necessary when approaching these machines. You know, understand how they work. Basically, all the sounds on the synthesizer move from left to right. Sound generation happens on the left with the oscillators, waveforms, and things like this. And sound manipulation happens kind of near the center with the filters, the, the, that way you're shaping what's coming from the left. And then on the right, you've got the envelope generations, which is like, uh, how a sound begins, sustains itself, and then goes away into silence. So with those three areas, the synthesizer is designed to make sounds from left to right. So there's a flow. And it's, it's amazing how the brain picks up on that. You know, it says, yeah, um, it, it, it makes sense to me now. You know, you start here, it goes to the manipulation, and it, it's refined over here. And so sometimes you can flip that around you know, any way that you want. But I really prefer the flow of sound going in a certain direction. So a lot of my sounds have that beautiful flow to it. And that's intentional. You so know? what type of toys and tools do you use to dial the faders and, or slide the faders mm -hmm. and dial the knobs and get the oscillation right. where you want it? 
Well, uh, there are certain synthesizer techniques um, that are analog. They come from analog waveforms uh, moving through analog circuitry, and that gives a certain character to the sound. Then you have digital circuitry, which gives a certain kind of clarity uh, that's not uh, uh, not possible using analog sounds. And then you've got linear technology, which is a whole nother level of the combination of analog and digital together. So you've got all these different kinds of things going on. Sampling is basically recording uh, sounds from uh, the earth from the environment and taking them into an electronic field and manipulating them that way. So you've got sound coming from the outside, sound being generated from the inside, and all of these different techniques. All these techniques are like brought together and the smart people know when to use each of the techniques at a certain time. How to present a story that has a beginning and a middle and an end and using these flavors, you know, to dress or undress you know, certain things to, to blow the lid off the imagination or to make it sound comfortable. And the smart guys always know how to manipulate those things in a playful kind of way. You know, like Bach knew how to do it, you know. Uh, Beethoven knew how to do it, you know, just with very simple instruments. And if you go back and you listen, there's a lot of very playful things going on in their music. And a lot of that, I believe, is intentional. Whereas, you know, they're, they were using uh, church organs and pianos and harpsichords to generate this, which basically were moved into orchestral colors by great com conductors who understood their music, you know, and were able to orchestrate it a certain way so that it made sense in a huge scale or in a very simple way. The synthesis, his job is to do the same thing with moving electrons going through electronic circuitry and being able to come up with something beautiful on the other side or mysterious on the other side and then play with that. Be, be not necessarily humorous, ha-ha, but in a playful way, play with the universe of sound. Isn't that basically what God did? He plays the universe. You're going to do the same thing. So is there a silence mode or button that you use for that space? Uh, that basically comes from the imagination, comes from the mind. Mm. You would want a sound to go through a certain passage and then take it away and leave a space where, you know, the mind is, is moving along and all of a sudden there's just this empty space that you kind of fall through. There's a little cushion down there, you know, but you've taken away you know, all of the things that you would hold on to, like melody, for instance, you know, or beginnings and ends of things. You're going to remove all that and all of a sudden leave them floating in a field of energy, of musical energy, and then you're going to bring them back. Or maybe you're going to leave them out there. You know, that's the thing. It's like, I'm going to take you out there. Getting back is up to you. You know, I'm going to make it easy on you, you know. But sometimes I'm not going to make it easy on you. I'm going to play with a whole idea of linear, and I'm going to take that away and leave you in a cloud. And with these instruments, this kind of technology, it's very easy to do if you know how the instruments work. And it's a two-way language with these things. They speak to you, you speak to them. And the end result is music that people can appreciate. I really like the idea that you expressed with, you know, you're basically manipulating and, and managing electrons. Right. Which, which is exactly what's going on. Which, oddly enough, takes us full circle back to you working with the engineers and all the pocket protector folks mm -hmm. and focusing it from that scientific en engineering perspective. And how all that has been a consistent, again, a theme just like education, but it's been yes. a consistent theme throughout your work. Mm -hmm. Because, you know, in, in the early days, like in the beginning, when I first got into uh, electronic music, I was fortunate enough to have a synthesizer manufacturer 30 miles from my house. One of the main manufacturers of synthesized music was sitting there, you know, in Vernon, Connecticut. I was living in Hartford. 
And so I, I had the opportunity to go there in the morning and watch them not only build the synthesizers, but also discover new technologies as they were discovered and how they put them in there. And then they would give them to me and say, see what you can do with this. I just invented this thing. See what you can do with that. You know, does this make sense musically? You know, does it make sense not musically? And I would go both ways and say, keep on bringing it. You guys are geniuses. You know, you're manipulating the electronics and stuff. You're generating that. But I'm manipulating the higher end of it with the music moving the electrons through circuits that you guys made. So it was a great thing. You know, they, they would say, we don't know anything about music. We're just, we're just working with like knobs and dials and electrons. And I said, well, I don't know anything about, you know, electronics or, or engineering, the, what you guys know, but look at, the, look at the communication that's happening here. You know, we come together, the engineers and the music, and we end up making this. And it's amazing how this, that, that whole thing happened. That was in, in 75, 76, 77, when electronic music was very, very young, and these things were being discovered on a daily basis. And you were there, you know. We got this little circuit, I don't know, we call it sample and hold. Oh, uh, that's an engineering term, but we have no idea how to make music with this thing. Could you make sense of this? And I would take it up to the studio and go, holy mackerel, are you sure you guys don't know what you're doing? <laughs> this is a universe you just threw at me. Wow. And it was it's it was that kind of communication between the engineers and the artists that was totally, you know, a hundred percent both ways. To me, it brings a, a whole new use of the term STEM, right? That's used in education, yes, science, science, technology, technology engineering, engineering and, and math. And I think that they just need to either, re well, to keep the math, the M for the math, but just add M for music. Mm -hmm. Right? Um, yeah. It, it, that would work absolutely because music is mathematics in, in, in a beautiful form. And that's why some, you know, mathematicians look at their equations as musical signatures, musical notation. So sometimes, you know, if I want to, if I want to read music, I'll open up a physics book and I'll see form function of the linear thing as X equals zero as we go on to the, you know, this, this whole thing, the language that mathematics says. And I said, this is music. This is sheet music to me. I can translate that whole equation that's like 25, you know, linear things long and just create a symphony out of them just by looking and translating what your musical mathematics is talking about. So that's why I get along with physicists really well. I had mentioned earlier about my philosophy of reality, the informatica. And yeah, one of the... Word. One of the constructs, this, the subtext is the metrics in the matrix, right? So Bingo. The, the metrics yeah. are all the things that we use to delineate, dis give distinction and differentiation to whatever it is. Mm -hmm. you know, there's some kind of um, measurement that's happened. And yep. so all of that occurs in the matrix, which is the space that everything exists yep. in. And one of the uh, mathematical symbols that I discovered years ago that is just, I think, kind of talks about what we're talking about today with what mm -hmm. is the sound of space is yeah. the symbol for the empty hyperset, which, oh, is, yeah. which is a, a circle with a line through it. Mm -hmm. And the definition of the, the simple definition of an empty hyperset is all functions but no members so Ooh. anything that is a mathematical construct a formula or whatever is in mm. the the empty hyperset and it just sits there waiting for the members the numbers the data to be put in to kick mm -hmm. off the formulas and the uh, calculations and whatever might be in that hyperset wow mm -hmm. So as you were describing what you're doing and, and your experience with science and technology and engineering and, and math and then the music, to yeah. me is, is, is space is an empty hyperset. Everything is there to be uh, used wow. and processed. Uh, you just have to be engaged with it and go participate. Absolutely. That's, that's the trick right there. Engage with it.
become one with it. And that, that speaks you can again. You talk mind meld, you know, in Star Trek, you know, I'm going to mind meld with it. I'm going to become <laughs> one with it. Look what happened to him. Just, <laughs> well, the same thing can happen to you. You know, you can touch infinity using these languages. You can touch infinity. I'm convinced. And and I don't think you have to be the, the key component to it. Um, you remember when, in, back in the early 2000s, when the law of, or the secret came out and it was about the law of attraction, mm -hmm. right? Extremely well done, a very important uh, yes. piece of of cultural and, and mental information. But when Absolutely. I watched it, I said, ah, they skipped a step. In order to have the law of attraction or to have the law of attraction engage in the act of mm -hmm. attraction, you need to start with intent. Ah, yes. And intention and curiosity and desire, all of the things that... Yes. That we that we feel and experience from a, an emotive, an emotion mm -hmm. as well as a motion perspective, um, the movement of consciousness, as I was saying earlier, that's just what it does. Can we explain it? Uh, there's, God knows how many theologies and philosophies and uh, mystery schools and mystic arts that explain yes, that's right. various elements of it. But nonetheless. All they're doing is giving definition to what we already see, what we experience, right. right? So if that's the characteristic and the attribute of the way reality is, and it all seems to happen in this wonderful thing that we call space that's supposed to be empty but isn't, and mm -hmm. everything occurs in this empty space which isn't, then the reality of being able to go and engage with it, to interact with wow. it, to have a purpose, a purposeful intent, to mm -hmm. go in and kick off your your curiosity and go play in your overly fertilized field of imagination. That's yeah. where the magic is. And I think that That's the music it. the music is what takes us there and, and is our playground. It's the environment in which we go and experience this playground of reality. That's right. Absolutely. Absolutely. And these machines are capable of that. It's like, you know, I... I uh, it's almost like a worship that kind of happens here and it kind of goes both ways in a way. It's like you present to me this, this keyboard here, this, this memory move that's sitting here, you present to me the ability to touch the face of infinity. You, you enable me to, you know, I, I love you. You know, there's a really cool thing that kind of goes beyond and it's two way. It's two-way. It's like when you look at the knobs and the patch bays and the things that are written here and the, the keys and the, even the wood, you know, that they're made of, that they're enclosed in, you know, it's all a language. It's it's all just a presentation. The, the Someone who is sensitive enough to understand that language can create wonderful things out of it, you know, and I'm, I'm humbled by this technology, just absolutely humbled. I am humbled by uh, your work, uh, by your you. mind, and by you. You are truly one of the most honest and authentic emanating energetic beings that I know. And I am very, you, very Marcus. grateful to not only know you, uh, but to be able to share in this journey with you and, and just see how your experience with reality manifests through your um, the energetic engagement with the electrons that you right the mothership mm -hmm. you do it's just fascinating and i think that we should probably look at doing some additional uh shows together and talk about some sure. of the ideas that we can further explore particularly on the education side and on right. the musical side some of your other works um are, are just they're, they're profound, and unless people get a chance to explore and experience them, then they don't realize that the things that we've been talking about, the sound of space, is the sound of the space of the place that everyone inhabits. Right, right. And there's a you magical... have a really good understanding of this. You just, you just really do. Your, your understanding of what's going on here is profound to me. 
perhaps that's why we've been uh, such good friends for so many decades. Yeah. It's, it's always one of those incredible. Every time I talk to you, I just I come away with this in, just joyous, euphoric kind of damn another another time with John, and that was good. Wow, thank you so much. I feel the same way. You know, there's not a lot of you floating around there, Robert. <laughs> you, <laughs> you are you're a very unique, you know, individual. Someone who I really enjoy communicating with. I mean, just you understand. You have, you know, and to understand something means to stand under it, you know, to be humble about it and uh, and and to learn. And so that's how I feel. I learn from you and, and I appreciate the friendship very much. Well, uh, gratitude to you, my friend. This has been mm -hmm. an outstanding conversation. Um, I'm looking forward to seeing what other people think and what they glean from this because I think there's a lot of things. It's interesting how we started mm -hmm. with the sound of space and went all the way around the solar system, if you will, and have kind of yeah. come back. We've traveled and taken a look at various planetary stops and moons and maybe even danced on a comet or two in, in the conversation. There it is, yeah. yeah. So um, yeah. thank you very much, John. It's been my honor and pleasure to have you here. Well, thank you, Robert. It has been an honor and pleasure for me, too. I appreciate it very much. Thanks for listening to this episode of the Nexus Nextcast. You can find us on YouTube, Facebook, and Rumble. And please like, share, and subscribe.